On the evening of the 20th of October 2007 in Wellington, Ohio, Heidi and her partner Andrew were going over to her parents' house to watch a baseball game on TV as a family. However, nothing could have prepared Heidi for what she saw when she got there. Her mother literally lying dead on the sofa, gunshot wounds across her face and chest, whilst her father lay on the floor in a pool of his own blood. Panicked, she rings 911, only to turn around to discover that her little brother Daniel was holding the gun. This is the case of Daniel Patrick. Hi guys, welcome back to my channel. Thank you for joining me. Today's case is an interesting one, mainly because the perpetrator of the crime has talked openly about why he did it. And I always find it really interesting when you can track ahead in time from the moment that the actual crime occurred to the present day and connect with the actual individual who carried out the horrific tragedy we're gonna talk about today. Because it gives you an insight both into the past and the present and I find that really intriguing because when you think about age even though I do not believe that there is any excuse when you're a young person to take life I also know that there is a difference between how you feel at 16 and certainly how you feel at 30 it's incomparable think about the decisions that you made when you were 16 just think about some of the hairstyles that's usually enough to let us be aware that we're not always thinking in the most cogent of ways and today's story is going to highlight some of those concerns that we have when we look back at our behaviour in the past versus what we would be like in the present. And it's also going to highlight that very clear reality that sometimes the people that you need to be most scared of are the people closest to you. By the way, before I kick off with the rest of this story today, I just want to say a big thanks to all of you returning to my channel. I adore every single one of you. And for those of you who might be new here, I release my crime content on a Wednesday and a Sunday religiously. So if you like crime and you like consistency, this is most definitely the channel for you. Also, massive shout out to my Patreon subs and my YouTube membership subs. Without you, I can't make this content. So major appreciation. Right, let's kick off with today's case. So Daniel Petrick, who was nicknamed Danny by his family and friends, he was born on the 24th of August 1991. He was born in Wellington, Ohio. At the time this crime takes place, Danny Petrick is 16. He lived with his dad, Mark Petrick, who was 45 at the time of this, and he's a Pentecostal minister at the New Life Assembly of God Church in Wellington, so obviously a deeply religious family. Mother was Susan Petrick. She's 43 at the time of her death. She worked at a nursing home part-time, so very vocational, caring for people. It's not a simple job, it takes a lot of energy, a hell of a lot of empathy, and that says something about who she is as an individual. And she's also trying to do her best to raise three children, something that Daniel, her son, admits that she absolutely did. Mark and Susan were also known to go out and minister to people wherever they went. So essentially, they were really good human beings. But aside from them being really good human beings, they were individuals who went out of their way above and beyond to reach other people. So they're not just good parents. They're not just loving people. They see it as part of their civic duty, shall we say, to actually bring other people to God. And whether you're religious or otherwise, it tends to come from an individual with a really good heart. And whether you're religious or otherwise, it tends to resonate that a lot of people who do feel that they want to get God's message out there genuinely have decent hearts. I also appreciate there are quite a few who may, I don't know, come across as a little bit patronising and don't necessarily follow diligently the rules that they suggest others should. So I appreciate it, just stressing that for balance. Now, according to Mark, Danny's father and Patrick, now, according to Mark, Patrick's father, he had a really loving relationship with both he and his mother. So 
there were no real warning signs that there was anything malevolent or problematic in Petrick's behaviour before the night that we're going to be talking about today. His friends and people who knew him well enough, so even those people who had minimal interactions but saw him regularly, they all said the same. He was just a normal, happy teenager. One student said that he was really friendly, he was really fun to be around. And people who went to church with him said that he was really enthusiastic about the Bible. So he was somebody that was, to some degree, following in the footsteps of his parents. But certainly there are no red flags jumping out at us regarding his childhood. When it came down to his academic achievement, he was considered a relatively average student. So he wasn't somebody who stuck out for any good or bad reasons. He was just somebody who was going through the motions of his education and doing fine. No discipline situations occurring at school, no serious suspensions or exclusions. So to all intents and purposes, genuinely going through the motions of teenagehood without too many problems. Now, I think we can all agree that if you're being brought up in a very religious household, there will probably be a rub at some points with your parents. I mean, anybody who's been brought up in a household with rules that are really rigorous, they are gonna find a position where at times they don't feel that that matches how they wish to act in their life. And most of us can look back at our teenage years and think that even in quite lax conditions, even in lenient households, the truth is we still tend to find things to disagree over because you are psychologically, emotionally, and socially growing into the human being adult-wise that you're gonna become, and you are testing boundaries, and you are falling out with people, and you are creating your own thoughts and feelings around certain beliefs, and the truth is, that means that you're gonna disagree at times with your parents. So when you look at the fact that Petrick is growing up in an environment where there will be quite a lot of rigor around expectations, understandably, he might grow in some resentment. It might be beneath the surface. He may believe that he has to act in accordance to God's wishes and therefore not act out at home. But he could be seething to a degree because he feels that there is a mismatch between his feelings about how his life should be versus the way that his parents expect his behaviour to be. But it's not overt. This isn't obvious to anybody. Everyone says that Petrick is somebody that didn't stand out for any bad reasons. In fact, if they were going to say anything, they'd be talking about the fact that he stood out for relatively good reasons. So we get to the 20th of October 2007. It's the evening at this point. And Petrick's sister Heidi and her husband, Andrew Archer, they are going to Petrick's house because they want to watch a baseball game on TV together. So again, what are we seeing here? A unified family. This is something that demonstrates closeness. And that's what makes these kind of crimes so astonishing because you just think about the type of family who hang out for the baseball games. They're excited to be together. They make an occasion of it. It speaks of closeness, connection. It speaks of characters that get on with one another. So the last thing that you're going to expect in this kind of a scenario is one member of this close connected family turning on another. So it turns out, and some would say this was divine intervention to some degree, that sister and her husband arrived two hours earlier than they're supposed to. They wanted to spend even more time with the family before the game started. And again, what does that speak of? It speaks of, as I just noted, that real connection. Now, Petrick won't be expecting this. He thinks they're going to be coming later. So he's shocked when they arrive and he literally greets them at the door. And at this moment in time, he says, look, can you not come in? And he talks about the fact that the parents are fighting. But Heidi, first of all, is disconcerted by this because let's be honest, we've all been in scenarios where people that we love are having, shall we say, a few stern words with one another. It's rare in my own household. Me and my husband get on very, very well. But there are occasions where I don't know, he'll breathe in the wrong way. And at that point, I don't know, there'll be some kind of response from me, such as stop breathing that way. What I'm saying is, there's always a little bit of conflict. And if one of my kids was witnessing my, shall we say, discontent, and then another one of my children arrived, they wouldn't be like, oh, you can't come in. And secondly, the child who just arrived would be like, what if a duck's back, mate? 
no, this is life. So you're not going to accept it. And Petrick's sister Heidi doesn't accept it. And also she attends to the reality that she hears something unusual. She hears groaning. And that is deeply distressing for her because she can immediately tell something is really wrong. So when she hears this groaning, she literally rushes past Petrick because she wants to know what's happened why her parents are groaning, what could possibly have played out to create this situation. And that's when, with horror, she sees her mother. And immediately she recoils, recognising that her mother's been shot multiple times. And it gets even worse because her dad is also very badly wounded. He's still alive, but he's been shot in the head and his injuries are incredibly serious. So he's got a shattered jaw. And can you imagine for Heidi walking in, she's just realized that she's lost her mother. And in the chaos and confusion that's unfolding, she's now looking at her father who has been horrifically disfigured in this moment, because when you've been shot in such a way that your jaw is shattered, you can imagine just walking into that situation is gonna be deeply traumatic for the person finding you. But in spite of this horrific injury that he's sustained, he manages to tell Heidi that her brother Petrick shot him. Now, bear in mind, all this time that her father is actually explaining this to Heidi, her brother Petrick is basically attempting to put the blame upon his dad. So he, early on, has decided that he's got a backstory. Bear in mind that it's likely he thought his dad would die. He thought the injuries that he had sustained would kill him. He wasn't expecting his sister to turn up two hours early and he certainly wasn't expecting his father to be able to implicate him in the crime. And it is sinister when you consider that he must have planned this because he didn't expect his sister to arrive. So his father would ultimately likely have been dead if she'd come two hours later. So at this point, Heidi calls 911, desperate to get help for her father. And she turns around. And when she turns around, she realises that her brother has actually picked up the handgun that had been lying on the couch. Fortunately, Andrew, her husband, takes the gun from Petrick's hand and he does give it up without any resistance, to be fair. But in that moment, she must have feared for her life. You couldn't not. You've got one person dead and you've got another person who could be near death themselves. So this person who shot them is quite capable of killing others. And now you've got witnesses because Heidi and her husband have witnessed what's played out and also heard Petrick's father actually say it was him who did it. So if you're going to be motivated to kill, that kind of scene playing out in front of you would certainly embolden you potentially to do that because you want to escape, you want to get away with it, you want your story to make sense. Could he say, my dad killed my sister and her husband as well? So in that moment, Heidi must have been absolutely terrified. Now, after he gives up the gun, he runs out of the house and he basically flees the scene in a family van. And the police are soon on his tail. They intercept Petrick as he's driving and they force him out of the car. And literally, when you listen to him being handcuffed by the police, he's shouting, my dad shot my mum. So Petrick is really going with this story. The idea that his father has lost it, shot his mother, shot himself and that he is literally a victim in this situation. Because you would be, if that had really happened to you, if you've been through the psychological trauma of witnessing your mother murdered by your father and then your father tried to kill himself in front of you, that is gonna be absolutely deserving of empathy and sympathy. It's gonna be a sliding doors moment in your life that everyone feels sorry about. But if that's not true, if you're constructing a false narrative trying to implicate your dad, who is very badly injured but still alive, in the murder of your mother, that's multifold as far as the malevolence involved goes because you're quite happy for another person to take the fall for something you've done. Now, when the first responders get to the scene, Susan Petrick is pronounced dead. It's clear that she had no hope of surviving her injuries. Mark, however, Petrick's father, is still alive. And so they end up rushing him to hospital. And it's a miracle, it genuinely is a miracle that he survived. And he was in hospital for 30 days. He had to have 
five surgeries because he had to have reconstruction surgery on his eye socket, had to have it on the roof of his mouth, on his jaw. His injuries were absolutely horrifying. When Petrick is taken into the police station for questioning, he goes with this story about it being his father who's responsible. He says, I was sitting in my room and my dad was just yelling, just screaming at my mum. So now he's bringing in this idea that mum and dad have got a problematic relationship, that there are reasons why this shooting would have played out, being that his father was mad at his mum. And then he starts crying and he's suggesting that Mark, his dad, walked into his bedroom, then walked out again. Then Petra had actually heard this gunshot and at this point, he sees his mum's dead body. His dad then points the gun at Patrick and then says he's sorry and then shoots himself instead. He then tells investigators that he called his friend Steve because obviously he's shocked. I don't know why you wouldn't be calling 911, just throwing it out there. But yeah, allegedly he said that he called Steve, told his friend what had happened. His friend didn't believe him and told him that he needed to go over and see him. So Petrick was motivated to do this. On the way out, grabs his copy of Halo 3, the video game. Because that's what most of us would do in a deeply traumatic situation where our father had allegedly killed our mother in front of us and also shot themselves. I mean, the first thing you'd think about is I just need to go and get my video game. Just priority list of everyone in such a horrific, traumatic situation. But that's what he does. So he gets his Halo 3, jumps in the minivan, and the police actually found that video game on the front seat. So the police then go on in the interview to ask what happened when his sister arrived. And Daniel Petrick said, well, I just tried to keep her out of the house. I didn't want her to see my parents like that. But arguably, he lied to his sister. So ultimately, he can say, I tried to keep her out, but that doesn't make any sense. She heard the groaning and came in because clearly there were seriously injured people in the home. But he says that they're just arguing. Now, anybody in a situation where that had played out would just say, don't come in, something terrible has happened. You would just be honest. You wouldn't cover something up and pretend that your parents were rowing. It makes no sense because ultimately it's going to be found out that they've been killed and injured. So you may as well just make it clear, do not come in. It's terrible what's unfolding here. They would still likely go past you to do that, but it would be in the context of truth. He doesn't do that. So he's lying from the get-go. At this point, the police say, well, did anyone touch the gun? Because they want to know if there's any links where Patrick's concerned with the firearm. And he said, yeah, I did. I touched the gun. I moved the gun because my father was still alive and I didn't want him to try to hurt himself again. So now he's given them a reason as to why his fingerprints will be on the weapon. So he is thinking about how to get away with this, ideally. Patrick also went on to tell the investigators that he'd been in trouble recently with his parents because he'd snuck out of the house to buy the game Halo when it had been released. And Daniel's, Patrick's father, Mark, was not okay with that. He didn't approve of the game. He didn't like the game. He wanted his son to not be involved with the game. So he actually took it off him and locked it in his dresser, which was right next to his gun. Also, Petrick said that on the night of the 20th of October, he'd actually asked his parents if he could go to the movies with his friends. But this is when his parents had started to argue and this is when he'd heard the gunshot. So his story doesn't make a lot of sense to investigators. You know, he's saying a lot of stuff, trying to fill in gaps, trying to connect why his forensic evidence would be on the gun. But it doesn't really make sense at all. There are so many holes in this and investigators aren't going to take long to point that out. Now, one of the things that really stands out in the interrogation with the detectives is the fact that Patrick is acting like he's crying. But the crying doesn't feel authentic. And the interviewing detective actually said that Daniel Patrick was boo-hooing, but not crying. And due to the severe nature of the crime, considering, you know, his mother's been shot and his father's been shot in the head, you would expect Daniel Patrick to be absolutely inconsolable, to be traumatised. I suppose you can say on the spectrum of emotions, some people go into absolute numb shock, so they will be quite blank. But even that's contextual. So if somebody's acting completely blank and numb, they're not able to string sentences together. And then you get people who are highly erratic and highly anxious. And again, that's contextual because whilst anxiety can also show guilt, 
often it's more in the panic realm because something truly despicable has played out and you've had to witness it. And arguably in this scenario, he's going for the more normalized, I'm crying, it's sad, but he doesn't have the amplification that's expected on that reaction. Because if you're gonna cry, you're gonna be sobbing. You're gonna have big, massive tears rolling down your cheeks as you sit absolutely blindsiding and stunned by the reality of what's just happened to you. But that's not how it appears. And that causes questions for the investigators. They just know it isn't a typical reaction to the crime that's played out. Unsurprisingly, it doesn't take very long for Daniel Patrick to start telling the truth. Bear in mind, there's a living witness. His father survived, so he's going to have to admit what really happened. His dad's story is going to make a lot more sense than his is. So he admits to the police that the story wasn't true. And he quote said, it was not plausible. It wasn't even realistic. So not even Petrick believed in his own story. Now around a year before the crime plays out, Daniel Petrick had had quite a serious accident. He had a skiing accident, a snowboarding injury, and he contracted a staph infection. Now this caused serious damage to his spine and he'd actually had to spend a long time housebound. So he's recuperating during this period. During this particular time, he begins to play the game Halo. Now Halo is a video game and it was introduced to him by his friend, Jonathan Johnson. And as far as Petrick talks, he feels like he became addicted pretty quickly to it. So he'd play this particular video game for seven or eight hours straight and reportedly spent also 18 hours at times on this game. Family members said he was very connected to it. So Halo itself, a game, it's a violent video game, it is, and it basically puts Xbox players in the role of space marines fighting invading aliens with really high-tech weapons. So it's rated M, which is mature, by the Entertainment Software Rating Board. And whilst it's definitely violent, I wouldn't say it's more violent than Call of Duty, maybe even less so, because I guess in Call of Duty you're actually killing people, whereas in this game you're killing aliens. Now, Petrick's dad, really didn't like that video game. He really didn't think that video game violence was acceptable. So when Petrick had said that he wanted to buy it for himself, his dad basically said, you're not playing it at all. I want you to stop playing these games or I want you to leave the house. Now that is quite an extreme reaction, but we have to remember that his father is very religious and he probably wants to make a very clear boundary that this is not going to be something that you win on you are going to either remove yourself from this connection with the game or you're going to have to be removed from the home. And I think that it would be better to sit down and have a conversation as to why you feel unhappy about this particular child's connection to the game. I think it's more important to actually have those conversations and to discuss and collaborate and figure a way forward. It would be sensible as far as I'm concerned to just limit the amount of time he spends on the game as opposed to banning him. In fact, there's research done that says if you decide to discipline a child by taking their screens off them, by stopping them playing a particular game, by making it a punitive or reward system, you actually connect them further. You make them want it more. So it's better not to use those kind of ways of punishment. And for Daniel Petrick, this is a big deal. He's been using this game to get through his recuperation. He's connected heavily with it. It makes him probably feel part of his peer network and to have it removed and to have it removed in such a extreme way is going to cause deep resentment. It would cause resentment for any child. Now, following that particular decision, Daniel Petrick does actually move out to his friend Jonathan's house for the weekend and apparently plays it there as well. This is one week before the shooting. So he just goes over and is like, well, as a response to my father not allowing me to play the game, I'm just going to sit in front of the screen for 48 hours straight playing. I don't need sleep. Sleep is for the week. I shall just continue through this pain barrier where really I know I'm exhausted, but just keep going nonetheless. So this is typical behavior, let's be honest. Young people do play a lot of video games. Do I think that's really good for young people? No. Do I think some's okay? Absolutely. Do I think kids overuse this kind of technology? 100%.
Are we seeing some problematic realities because of this? Yes, we definitely are. So I'm not hiding from the fact that too much time on a game is a problem. It is, particularly violent games, not because I think it's gonna mean people go out and kill other people, no, because the way that the brain engages with violent video games means that there is a temporary drop in empathy. And if you need something to push you over the edge behaviorally, then a drop in empathy might just do that. So we really want to avoid, particularly young men, particularly teenage young men, having that drop in empathy for too long. And the more that you play it, the more that you sustain it, the more likely that drop in empathy will last longer than it should. And then, like I said, it's temporary. It will go back to normal. But what you do when that happens is what we have to explore. Could there be a link with people doing something impulsive and negative just after playing a violent video game because of that drop in empathy? And the chances are, yes, it could. So in spite of the fact that his dad has been very clear, you do not play this game here, you do not buy Halo, Daniel Petrick defies him. Goes out, buys his own copy of the recently released Halo 3 without his dad's knowledge. Of course, this isn't going to work out well for Daniel Petrick because we all know our kids. Our kids think they can deceive us. I mean, sometimes they'll get away with it, won't they? But for the most part, we have a nose. We can sniff it out. And that's what his dad does. So Daniel Petrick is bringing the game into the house and Mark finds it immediately, basically confiscates it straight away and places it, as I said, in a safe inside his bedroom. And that safe, as noted before, has a handgun, a 9mm Taurus PT-92 handgun in it. Again, in the UK, we do not have guns available to us. I appreciate in the States it's a very different story, but when you have access to guns, if you've got a kid who maybe has got problems with their behaviour or have got issues with impulse control, really having a gun around is not a good idea. It's Perfectly acceptable, I get it, if you are an adult and you're in control of your behaviour and you can look after your guns in a safe place. But I think if kids have access to it, then we are giving them an opportunity to act in a reckless manner. And unfortunately, if you act in a reckless manner with a gun, the consequences can be absolutely grotesque. And we do see that happen again and again. We get to the 20th of October 2007, so this is just after a week of that game being confiscated. Daniel Patrick finds his father's key, the key to the safe. So he unlocks it, takes the game out, but he also takes the gun out. And that's disturbing, isn't it? Because it's one thing being a naughty kid, doing something you know your dad would disapprove of, taking that game out because he knows he's gonna get into trouble. Ultimately, he's been banned from using it. But taking the gun, that's a total different level of behavior because that suggests that he knows there's going to be a strong reaction from his father. And it suggests that he's likely thought about what he'll do when his father realizes he's got the game. And that's why he's given himself the gun because he's intending to use it. So there is a level of premeditation here. Now around 7 p.m., Daniel Patrick walks up behind his parents. They're just sitting on the couch together. And he says, would you close your eyes? I have a surprise for you. Now his dad at this moment in time is thinking, oh, that sounds nice. Thinks he's got this pleasant surprise for him. Bear in mind, you know, they've obviously had a few altercations because of this game. And he's in a scenario where they're about to watch a game with Heidi, his sister and her husband, and they're having a coming together of a family and maybe Petrick's had a thought about his behavior and he's actually gone out of his way to do something nice. And that's really dark, isn't it? It's really dark that if you're lying to somebody about a surprise because they think it's gonna be a good one, when actually you're intending to take their life, again, that's a very deceptive nature, but also, something like I said that's incredibly dark about the way they're acting. So his dad closes his eyes and suddenly his head goes completely numb. And the reason it goes numb is because he's been shot in it. Then he notices that he's got blood just pouring from his skull. So Patrick shoots his dad 
in the head once and then shoots his mum in the head, in the chest, in her forearms. But then he actually gets the gun, places it in his father's hand with this intention of making the crime look like a murder-suicide, saying, hey, Dad, here's your gun, take it, because he wants his father to be holding it. But of course, it all goes wrong because his sister and brother-in-law arrive early. Once they've discovered what's happened, he flees the scene, taking his Halo 3 copy with him. So this is what actually happened. So even though Petrick is only 16 years of age, what we can say is about the way that he's tried to deceive people, make out that his father is the person who's guilty, that he's certainly got a level of cunning because he's intended, at least initially, to get away with killing his own mother and killing his own father, ideally. And even when his father survived, he's still going down that road. So even though he does admit his guilt eventually, the point is he was quite happy for his father to take the fall and that is deeply sinister. It has gone wrong, but he would have been happy for his father to have been considered the murderer of his wife and his mother. So he would have allowed his father to have his reputation sullied and devastated in the local community that actually respect him. And you have to be a particular type of character to be willing to do that. So even though he's 16 and he's got a developing conscience, not a fixed conscience without a doubt, it is dark, his behavior. So the trial was held from December the 15th to the 17th, 2008. It was held at the Lorraine County Court of Common Pleas in Elyria in Ohio. The judge was James Burge. Now, Petrick had rejected a jury trial because they felt that a jury trial may not give him as fair a trial because there were so many emotions involved in this case. So he decided that he wanted a judge alone to actually decide on the appropriate sentence. The prosecution, or well, Anthony Cilio, he was the person who was prosecuting. He portrayed Petrick, as you would expect, as a heartless killer who showed absolutely no remorse for his actions. He said that he planned his crime really carefully and he knew that his sister and her husband were going to be coming over at 9pm, but they arrived two hours early, which foiled his plan. He also put forward the idea that the reality of the crime was premeditated, so he'd tried to set up the shooting as a murder-suicide because he wanted to get away with it. And he ordered a psychological report to be carried out on Petrick as well. And when that happened, the psychologist said that Petrick had actually admitted that he'd planned the murder of his parents for a week. So this prosecution is going hard down the line of this was premeditated first degree murder. End of. It deserves the most serious sentencing and that essentially no empathy or understanding should be afforded Petrick. He's a cold-blooded killer, is what the prosecution is saying. Now, the defence was led by James Kersey, so he was a defence attorney. Now, neither Kersey nor Petrick actually tried to dispute the facts of the crime. They agreed that what had played out had played out. But instead, they went for quite an unusual defence. They went for insanity, which we all know, if you come to my channel in America, it is incredibly difficult to have that defence pled successfully. It really is. There's such a high bar. So what they say is he was insane because he had video game addiction and that that was the underlying psychiatric condition. A lot of people in my area would say that doesn't make sense because if you've got an addiction, you shouldn't just be able to turn something off and it'd be over. Because that's the truth. If you have a video game addiction, just unplug it. You literally can have it removed. You won't have any physiological reaction, maybe some anxiety, but it's not like you're going to go cold turkey. It's not like you're going to get the shakes and sicknesses because you've got some physiological reaction to drugs being cleansed from your system. And also you're not going to lose your home because you've gambled all your money away. You know, these things, things like gambling, drugs, alcohol, there are some genuine consequences that are enormous. Whereas, like I said, with gaming addiction, you just take the game off a kid and it's done. Yeah, they'll act out, yeah, they'll get upset, but it's over. They're not going to end up quivering in a corner whilst their body is literally cleansed of whatever it is they've put in there. But everyone has their opinion. Some people genuinely do believe that gaming can be a very strong addiction. But they additionalise this argument by saying, look, 
he was more susceptible to these kind of problematic behaviours because of the staph infection that he experienced after he'd had his accident. So they said the amount of stress that that put on his body, and with respect, staph infection has been linked to mental health deterioration, it's been linked to brain deterioration, and the fact that, add to that, he'd had this spinal injury caused by it, it meant that Patrick was much more susceptible to be influenced by the game, and we have to add to that by his age. So these are all contributing factors to why he acted this way. And they argue that Patrick just wasn't in the right state of mind to understand the finality of shooting his parents. So they argue that because he'd been playing these games again and again and again, because they were violent games, and because the individuals get reset and so brought back to life to some degree at the end of it, that he just didn't connect, that death was permanent. I am not a medical doctor, so I cannot say that staff wouldn't do that to you. I cannot say that it isn't possible that you would be more susceptible. That's not my specialism. But what I am saying is, when I was 16, I was not walking around the streets thinking, ah, oh, I could uh, kill that girl who fancies the guy that I like. And then after she's been killed, she'll come back to life and it'll all be fine again. But I'll have taught her a lesson for fancying somebody that I fancied. You know, you're 16. My kids, at around the age of eight, understood the permanence of death. So I'm thinking the defence is stretching it just a little. Could you imagine if every 16 year old was playing violent video games and just haphazardly going around and murdering people going, it'll be fine, just reset. Just where's the, where's the button? Where's the reset button? There isn't a reset button. Of course there's a reset. Of course there's a reset button. There isn't. It's literally permanent. It's not permanent. Look at all these other 16 year olds. They agree with me. Also, where are the aliens? I haven't seen the aliens for a while. Honestly, it doesn't necessarily make sense what the defense is saying, but this is what they're going with. Now, without a doubt, you have, as I said, an impact on empathy after you play a violent video game, but it is very temporary. But this is the argument that he thinks that because the player returns to their original state after every reset, this will happen with his parents. So Kersey basically makes out that Petrick was somebody who believed because of this essential delusion that had been created that his mother would just eventually return to a healthy, normal state because he'd been immersed so long in this virtual violence. Just going to throw it out there. Okay, well, if he did think that his mother was going to come back to a normal healthy state, why did he try to pin the crime on his father? Is it just, is it just me? Is it just me? Sorry, so you're saying that you thought your mother would come back to life? Yeah, like in the video games, they come back to life. Right, but ultimately don't you literally give your father the gun and then tell the police that your father had killed your mother. I did do that. What did that? What did that? Just suggest that you're trying to pin the crime on your father because you know your mother is dead. I see where you're going with that and it does make sense, but um, oh sorry, is that an alien over there? Just, I don't like things not having logic and that doesn't have logic. I appreciate where the defence are going with this, but there's an illogical level to it. Now, Kirsty also disputes the prosecution's assertions about Petrick's personality, because they're obviously trying to deride that in every way, shape or form. They want to make out he is a cold-blooded killer, but it, it really doesn't fit with his nature prior to this crime. And I do think that it makes sense that Kirsty brought up that Petrick's family, friends, and acquaintances were all saying, look, he's a normal, typical teenager. So even though the crime has been absolutely reprehensible, it isn't in line with Petrick's normal behaviour. And others could argue, well, a cold-blooded psychopath strikes when they're ready to strike. They don't have to demonstrate these kind of personality flaws and characteristic issues until the moment that they do. But it genuinely is disconcerting for the family and friends because Petrick has just seemed like a completely typical teenager.
They also bring in the fact that he literally took Halo 3 away from the scene of the crime because when he was fleeing, as opposed to just thinking about protecting himself and trying to escape, it was too much to let go of the very thing that he was completely fixated by, which is the video game. So that's quite a strong argument as far as I'm concerned for the defence. They're saying, listen, this kid was so deeply addicted and it makes sense that they put that forward because if your addiction is so strong that after killing your mother and nearly killing your father, the thing you're thinking about is, got to get my video game, of all things, that would suggest a very unhealthy link with it. Equally, somebody could argue, yes, but that's how a psychopath's brain would work. What is most important to me? My parents are dispensable, but the game isn't. So you can look at it in a multitude of ways. They also argue as a defence that Petrick wasn't actually plotting a murder, but he was somebody who just spontaneously killed without the planning. But one thing that the defence didn't do is they didn't present psychologists for an expert opinion on the mental effects of violent video games. That could be because there wasn't a lot of evidence out at the time that could link violent video games to any malevolent behaviour. So it wasn't something that was possible at the time. Or it could be that there were a lot of experts out there who just didn't believe that it should have an impact and couldn't ever be an excuse for this kind of behaviour. Petrick's father, Mark, he obviously attended court and he said that when he woke up in hospital, he just couldn't stop thinking about what happened that night. And he's been interviewed on television and talked about the fact that he wanted to kill him when he initially started to come round and think about what had played out. But he'd got to the point where he'd forgiven his son and more than that, he wants his son to have a second chance at life. He said, I can't count the number of times he's told me he's sorry. I can't count the number of times he said, Dad, I miss Mum. And that must be heart-wrenching for his dad because you are caught somewhere between the absolute disgust and the grief that you feel because of what's played out. He lost his wife, but equally, he has a child that he's brought up, a child that he's got a million memories with, a child that will have told him he loved him millions of times, a child that he thought he knew and that he still knows to some degree. And this behaviour is terrifying, but it doesn't discount the connection that Mark will feel with his son. And to take yourself from that initial place of hatred to a place of compassion, I think only a parent often can manage to bridge that gap. He's visited his son in prison countless times and his son's apparently repeatedly apologised for what he's done. He's apologised to the whole family. He's told his father, I'm so glad you're alive. And his father also testified that Petrick had a really close relationship with his mum and with him. And he even went on to plead with the judge to give his son a lenient sentence. So. The judge is going to hear that, understandably, because a father pleading for his son's life, pleading for his son's freedom to some degree, to give him a chance in the future to be a good pro-social human being, to be accepted back by his family, to be forgiven by the society who obviously felt so angry when he'd actually murdered his mother. That's powerful, isn't it, for the judge to hear? When it came to the sentencing, Daniel Petrick was convicted for aggravated murder, attempted aggravated murder and tampering with evidence because as we know, he got the gun and put it in his father's hands. The judge sentenced him to life in prison with the possibility of parole after 23 years. That was the minimum sentence that he could give him. The maximum sentence would have been life without the possibility of parole and the prosecution really pushed for this. They didn't push for the death penalty because of his age, but they went for the life without the possibility of parole. But the judge really was very lenient. Now, when the judge announced the verdict, he did, with respect, appear to place a lot more blame on the video game than he did on Petrick. Now, keep this in mind. It was 2007. First person shooting games were very new. So the long-term effects on teenagers and their brains and the long-term effects of consistently playing these types of games wasn't actually very widely known. But I do think it's quite a reach, isn't it, to say that because Petrick shot aliens who had taken over the world in a video game, that 
He thought his parents would respawn unharmed after he'd shot them in real life with a real gun. But the judge buys into it, so the defence did a pretty good job. So when the judge gave his remarks, he said this, I believe in the Halo 3, what it amounts to is a contest to see who can shoot most aliens who attack. It is my firm belief that after a while, the same physiological responses occur as in the ingestion of some drugs. I believe an addiction to these games can do the same things. I personally, as a professional working in this area, don't agree with that. I'm just going to throw it out there now. Because, as I said, there is genuinely a physiological response when you come off drugs. Because the drugs have to leave your system. So, to say that it's exactly the same just doesn't play out in reality. The only thing that I would note is that when you stop playing a game, as I've said, you do get a drop in empathy, but also the dopamine, the little reward that you'd get if you do something that you enjoy, that would obviously stop. And that might frustrate you to some degree. It might make you a little bit more resentful because you're not getting that kick. But again, I wouldn't believe for a second that that's going to make somebody go out there and do something really harmful to another human being. And then he went on to say... I firmly believe that Petrick had no idea at the time he hatched this plot that if he killed his parents, they would be dead forever. Again, I really struggle with this from a professional point of view. Don't get me wrong, I do totally appreciate that at 16 years of age, you have a lot of changing to do. I do think you can act at 16 years of age in a way and manner that you will not act in at 25. I do think you can change. I do believe in second chances for a lot of kids. I genuinely do. But I don't believe that we can involve ourselves in this, what I consider a delusion, where we're meant to buy into this idea that you at 16 years of age think that your parents can come back to life if you kill them. There's been too many examples in your experience where this just hasn't been proven. You've seen people die probably in your locality, your friend's parents or grandparents. You know that death is permanent. You are not a child. You are a grown person developing into an actual adult. So to throw it in that he really did believe that they'd come back to life, I just don't buy into it, not even for a second. And that doesn't mean, like I said, that I don't have total compassion and empathy for his family who believe that he does deserve a second chance. I accept that they know him better than I ever will. I'm just saying that I do not believe that the judge really has a hold on the truth in this situation. Now, despite many studies, there is no evidence that connects video games to real world violence, especially not on a scale like this. I've told you, I've said it before in videos, empathy drops a little but if you think about the statistics in 2022 alone over 3 billion people played video games now the exponential growth in gaming that's happening we haven't had an exponential growth in child video game murders so we aren't seeing it tally we would be expecting to note more and more killings based on the fact that this was inciting that behaviour and it just simply doesn't happen. And again, do I think that playing video games for long hours is problematic? Yes, I do. Get outside, go and do something else. It's good for your brain. Do I think they're terrible, a blight on humanity? Absolutely not. Bring joy to a lot of people, connect a lot of people all over the world and they act as a community connector. They're not an isolated experience. You are playing with other people. So I think there are far more benefits to the negatives. But as I've noted, there is a drop in empathy. Now, as I've already alluded to, Petrick has taken part in quite a number of televised interviews. He often talks about how he misses being free. And in one 2013 interview, he stated that when he got the gun from his dad's bedroom, his intention was that he did actually fully intend to kill his father. He says he was really angry. And I think that's really important because it means he's taking a level of responsibility and accountability for it. He's saying, I did intend to kill my dad. He also added that growing up, they were doing lots of hunting and target practice and shooting. So there was always a lot of guns in the house. And to me, and I appreciate some of you in America who listen, you are very aware of your amendment rights and you feel that you should always have the right to bear arms. But I do think that it would be good to have restrictive gun control. I genuinely feel that if guns were not as readily available or quite as normalised in the household, that there would be a drop in this kind of 
playing out of crimes. Equally, I do appreciate that I am from the UK and I therefore have a different cultural experience and I'm not trying to be negative towards people who feel very connected to their firearms. I'm just saying that sometimes we look at how these shootings take place and how kids get hold of these guns and we need to think about how we can make it safer so that people don't have access to do the things that Patrick did. And I guess what I'm saying most simply is that it wasn't the video game that caused the death of Patrick's mother. It was the available guns and of course possibly the behavioural psychological issues that a young person might be going through. That's going to be the thing that causes an individual to shoot somebody. There's no scientific evidence to back up that the video game is going to be responsible. And if it had been, that would have been introduced at Petrick's actual trial. And also, if we are to believe that the video game is responsible, then my God, we all need to take cover because children would be shooting their parents whenever they were mad. I mean, can you imagine the statistics on that? Every time a kid gets told no, you get shot. There wouldn't be parents, would there? Because 99% of children do argue with their parents, right? Simple as that. Now, there is an appeal that happened in 2015. So this is when Patrick was 24 years of age. And the reason for that appeal was he filed the papers saying that his lawyers, who were there to defend him, actually failed him. That neither Kersey nor his attorney, John Otero Jr., fulfilled their legal responsibilities to file an appeal challenging his conviction. So he said that they hadn't advised him correctly. He went on to claim that Kersey persuaded him not to appeal and he said that Kersey had promised him that the Ohio laws dealing with diminished capacity for criminal defendants would eventually change and that Daniel Petrick would get a new trial and that would result in a lighter sentence. Now, Kersey, I will say, went on to say that he didn't make any of those promises. But I do not know who is telling the truth there. But I would imagine that if you want to get an appeal, you're going to say whatever it takes to try to get it. Now, Patrick does have his supporters, to be fair, regarding whether he should actually be serving time in prison. So Jack Thompson, who's a disbarred Florida attorney, he's actually campaigning for a new trial for Daniel Patrick. Thompson has actually crusaded literally for decades. He is really against violent video games. He calls them murder simulators. And the core of Thompson's argument is that the addiction that Patrick had to Halo meant that he went on that rampage, that deadly rampage. So he says that he is somebody who's convinced that essentially Patrick was training for months to shoot his parents under the influence of that game. He said in a letter to Lorraine County Prosecutor J.D. Tomlinson, and along with other court officials, that he felt confident that if there were no such thing as a violent video games, he wouldn't know Daniel Petrick. Thompson even went on to praise Judge Burge, the person who'd given Petrick the more lenient sentence, as a visionary. Interestingly though, Burge might be considered a visionary, but he's also somebody who had to resign from the bench because he was convicted on a misdemeanor count of falsifying records and tampering with evidence himself. Interestingly as well, he's now working as the chief of staff at the prosecutor's office. But like I noted, He's no longer a judge because of what he did. Now, over the years, Thompson's spoken out against games like Doom, Grand Theft Auto and Bully. He says that it's just that these games are cultivating a generation of unhinged but deadly accurate shooters. Just going to throw it out there. I think probably the fact that Patrick was going out doing target practice with his family was likely going to make him a better shooter than playing these games. Just saying, I like logic. I'm a fan of logic but he genuinely is invested in this and now he believes there's proof. So in that same letter to Lorraine County officials, he provided a link to a World Health Organization decision from 2018. That's actually since been removed by the way, but they determined that gaming disorder is a clinical disease. Like I said, there is so much debate on this and I really struggle with this kind of addiction being put in the same place as something like opioid addiction. It is just incomparable. Like I said, you know, mum, I've got an addiction to this video game. It's gonna unplug it. There you go, problem solved. Even if you are somebody who uses it as a distraction technique from difficult feelings, it's gonna provoke some anxiety not having access to it. You're not going to have the same kind of reality 
coming away from gaming disorder, if you want to call it that, as you will from an actual physiological dependency. And even when that link was on, when you actually read what the research was saying, it was saying that there's a tiny, tiny proportion of people who engaged in these digital or video gaming activities that could fit that particular definition. And there will always be a tiny proportion of everybody who goes to excesses in certain areas. But I do not think an excess is the same as an addiction. Thompson's letter also went on to say that there was a study underway to find out what percentage of young people who play violent video games experience behavioural change as a result. And this has been really debated in scholarly circles. So there was a study published in the Journal of Economic Behaviour and Organisation, for instance, and they said that there was no solid evidence to connect video games to real-world violent behaviour. So the researcher who was in charge of that study said, I find no evidence that child reported violence against other people increases after a new violent video game is released. Thus policies that place restrictions on video game sales to minors are unlikely to reduce violence. And in the reply that Thompson got from Tomlinson, the prosecutor, they said, were research to show a causal link between video game deprivation and the level of violence demonstrated by Daniel Petrick in this case, that is something that should be considered. However, I do not believe that such circumstances would likely give rise to a defence in a murder prosecution. He said, video game addiction alone is insufficient to stand up as an insanity defence. Now, significantly, Thompson can't actually act as Petrick's lawyer if a retrial happened because he was permanently disbarred by the Florida bar in 2007. Apparently, there was unprofessional conduct claims so the Supreme Court of Florida upheld that disbarment in 2008. And it does feel that his disbarment did come from some quite appropriate claims. So before she was the US Attorney General, Thompson challenged Janet Reno for Dade County State Attorney in Florida. He called her a closet lesbian and alleged that she had mental disorders. Probably not the most appropriate thing to do for an individual in his position. So Petrick, at this moment in time, it doesn't look like he's going to get a retrial. He's currently incarcerated at Grafton Correctional Institution. He's been there since June 23rd, 2009. And barring further legal action, he won't actually be eligible for parole until November 2030. He'll be 39 years of age at that point. To be fair, I have to say that means that he's got a big, strong chance to make something good of his life. He could get married, he can have children. He's obviously got the incredible support of a very loving family. And for those to have forgiven his actions, for them to be able to separate the boy he was from the man he is, I think that is unbelievably grown. I'm not sure how a lot of you feel about that. I would hope that I would find the compassion in my heart if my own son had done something like this to follow the lead of his father and his family, because I do think there is a huge distinction between a child of 16 and, in this case, when he gets out of prison, a man of 39 years of age. And a first parole hearing is tentatively scheduled for September of that year, so he could walk free. Now, Patrick's father, Mark, he's actually now remarried, and that's good because we want him to have a life full of love. He's been through the horrific trauma of losing his wife and, to some degree, losing his son and certainly losing the structure of a family that he once absolutely adored and felt gratitude for, all of that was destroyed. So for him to find love again and to find that solid foundation, I think that's something that every single one of us would want for him. Sue Petrick, his wife who died, she's remembered by all of her friends as being just the most immensely caring, loving woman. She had time for everybody. She spent most of her life just devoted to the church and devoted to everybody else around her. She was a truly amazing woman and deeply significant in the lives of those individuals who were lucky enough to be loved by her and liked by her. It's one of those cases, isn't it, today's, which is quite confusing because we like black and white. We like the idea of good and evil. And for the most part, when we cover these kind of murders, you can kind of place individuals into those categories. But with Daniel Petrick, it's quite difficult. Looking back at his past, there was nothing too significant standing out that suggests that he was some evil predator, some malevolent murderer hiding behind the scenes with a mask of apparent suitability for his environment where other people looked at him as a decent human being, where really he was this horrible creature beneath. It feels as if when you look at his history, he was a good kid. 
nothing outstanding, but certainly nice qualities. People genuinely liked him and loved him. And it was so left field what happened. And could it be that in this case, in this case, that Daniel Petrick genuinely did become so connected, so fused with the game, not that he couldn't understand what reality was, but that the resentment that he felt for being denied what he felt was important in his life created such resentment that in the week leading up to the murder, he hoarded more and more anger towards the people that he felt were denying him the opportunity to spend his time doing what he really wished to do. And even though ultimately he still premeditated and planned the killings of the two people who loved him more than anybody in the world, he did it based on this growing feeling of anger and frustration and teenage resentment that ultimately led to the horrific decisions that we saw play out in this case. Or could it be that he genuinely is a cool, cold, calculated killer with a psychopathic mindset? That's something that only you guys can make up your minds for yourself. And the final question I guess I have for all of you is, do you believe that playing video games really can turn a normal child into a malevolent murderer? Let me know your thoughts in the comments. I'll see you again soon. Take care, guys.